He has a wide and varied background in education, working for many years as a trainer in intercultural communication for the Council of Europe. Over the past 15 years, he has published widely in applied linguistics on areas such as identity critical discourse analysis and intercultural communication. His main interests at the moment include English and intercultural communication in civil aviation, the merging of theories of critical realism and critical discourse analysis, and the development of English in the world, with a particular focus on East Asian and South American contexts. He co-edits the International Journal Language and Intercultural Communication and was a consultant to the National Centre for Languages in, recent in the recent development of the UK National Occupational Standards in Intercultural Working. He's currently working on a book entitled Global English and Political Economy and Imminent Critique. Dr. John O'Regan, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you very much for that very warm welcome. And uh, thank you very much for coming here this evening. I hope you can all hear me all right with this, this on. Uh, I'd also like to say hello to the uh, people in uh, Valparaiso and uh, welcome you here as well. Um, I'm, um, I'm going to talk about uh, well, in, something called English as a lingua franca. Um, I will explain what that is, just in case you haven't heard what English the lingua franca is. I'll be talking about that. Uh, and I'll be talking about English the lingua franca in the context of English as a global language. Um, now, I have a set of slides here. Um, and I'm aware that while you here in this room can probably see my slides quite clearly, uh, people in Valparaiso might not be able to see this very clearly. Uh, so I will try to explain, as well as I can, what is on each slide. And um, uh, I believe that we will arrange for the, um, these slides to be sent to uh, Valparaiso yeah. so that uh, uh, they can have a copy of my presentation. Um, now, English Lingua Franca, um, a critical response. Um, I've recently... the Journal of Applied Linguistics. And uh, this is the paper, uh, or at least this is the first half of the first page of the paper. Um, and as you can see, it says, English as a lingua franca, an imminent critique. Um, this word imminent uh, may uh, be causing a little bit of confusion because it sounds exactly the same as the word imminent, which means that something is going to happen now. Um, well, certainly what is happening now is my talk, but that isn't what imminent means here. Um, imminent critique uh, will be explained in a few moments, but I'll just say that um, uh, the term imminent critique comes from social theory, uh, critical social theory to be precise, um, uh, or at least it's closely associated with critical social theory, and if you're familiar with the Frankfurt School, and the work of people like Theodore Adorno and um, uh, Max Horkheimer and uh, Jürgen Habermas, then uh, you might well have come across imminent critique. Um, um, imminent critique is a methodology that is used within um, uh, Frankfurt School critical theory. It's also a, a methodology that's used within the philosophy known as critical realism. <coughs> and what it means is um, it means that when you uh, do a critique of a position or an argument that somebody or a group of people are making, uh, when you are making a critique of their argument, um, to do an imminent critique of their argument is to go inside their argument and to use the arguments that they make as uh, your tool for deconstructing the argument that they make. So you go inside their argument and you turn their argument back on themselves. Um, it has a long history. It's, as I said, mostly associated with Frankfurt School Critical Theory and Critical Realism recently, but imminent critique is a philosophical methodology that you can trace back to Plato. Um, so that's 
what I was doing with this paper. I was looking at this thing called English as a lingua franca and, uh, and then critiquing it from the inside. And that's what uh, this paper uh, is about. Um, I'll just say a couple of words, uh, well, more than a couple of words, I'll just say a few sentences about uh, English as a lingua franca or ELF. Uh, I will be saying a few more in a minute, but um, um, English as a lingua franca is a, well, is a term which is used to describe how English is used as a common language of communication between people whose first languages uh, are not English. It's not English. Um, so that's what English as a lingua franca prosaically means. That's what it means, to use English as a common language. Um, during the Roman Empire, um, um, Latin was a lingua franca. Uh, there have been a number of ling lingua francas through history. Um, and the most recent global lingua franca is, well, quite definitely English. And I want to talk about why that is in a moment. Um, but starting about, hmm, let me think, at the end of the, end of the last century, which sounds like a very long time ago, but it isn't really a very long time ago, um, uh, in the late 1990s, um, a certain group of academics, um, people like Jennifer Jenkins, Barbara Seidelhofer, uh, they started talking about English lingua franca in a particular kind of way. And um, they uh, have developed a school of thinking. Um, you could call it a school of thinking, uh, which is called English as a lingua franca. And um, over the last 15 years, there has been a large, uh, there have been a large number of articles and books dedicated to the concept of English as a lingua franca also known as ELF. And this uh, school of thinking has become uh, a, a research paradigm in itself. And um, it has many uh, adherents. There are many people who follow the sort of English as a lingua franca philosophy, uh, ideology, perspective. Um, now, as you can tell from my title, uh, my perspective is one which is in disagreement with uh, ELF, uh, with English as a lingua franca, and that is what my paper was about. Um, uh, but in short, then, um, the, to study English as a lingua franca um, in the past 15 years has been to put forward a view of English in the world whereby English is no longer the property uh, of native speakers. Uh, the basic argument being that there are far more non-native speakers of English in the world today uh, who are speaking to other non-native speakers of English uh, in English and that they are evolving their own original and innovative ways of communicating via English. And this uh, original form or variety or practice um, is referred to as ELF or English Franco, which is all fair enough, okay? That's all fair enough. So that's fine. Um, but as I said, my uh, paper is a critique of that perspective, and I want to show you why. Um, the paper itself is quite theoretical. I have, in order to make it digestible to a broad audience, I have um, taken out some of the more abstract passages of theory in this talk, uh, so that I hope that you will get a flavor and idea of what it is I'm trying to say about English as a lingua franca uh, that you can take away with you. Um, the talk is probably in two halves, in a way. The first part is uh, about how English became a global language. Why is English a global language? So I'd like to say a little bit about that. I'd also like to say something about English language globally. 
uh, and the Englishes in the world. And once we've established that, I'll then move on to talking about ELF and what that is in a bit more detail and why I am critiquing it. Um, so that's the more or less the, uh, the format for what I'm going to talk about this evening. And my plan is uh, to try not to talk for more than uh, an hour uh, so that uh, you will have time to ask me a few questions if you would like to uh, at the end of my talk. My talk might be less than an hour, but we'll see how we go. Um, I've got my watch on the table there, and I will keep a, keep a close eye on it. Um, I'll just have some water. Okay, so uh, English is a world language. Why, why is uh, English a world language? Um, well, there are two main reasons, really, and they're quite obvious ones. Uh, the first one is called the British Empire. Uh, and the uh, second one is called um, US-led globalization since 1945. Um, the British Empire, uh, as you probably all well know, uh, was around between 1750 and 1945 was the main period of operation of the British Empire. And it uh, covered uh, many parts of uh, the uh, the, the globe. Um, there, well, India was a colony, um, but there were colonies also in Africa and the Caribbean, uh, here in South America, uh, and also North America at one time, um, in the Middle East, Australia, Australasia, China. Uh, indeed, I was born in a British colony. I was born in Hong Kong. So, um, you know, I guess I'm part Chinese, part Irish. Uh, and a good example of a colonial product. Um, so the British Empire. Now the British Empire was a territorial empire. Uh, it uh, occupied territory, and this occupation ceded English in many parts of the world. Uh, so that to this day, in the ex uh, colonies of the British Empire, English is widely used as a second language. Um, by the people who live there. And uh, there are large English language communities, um, there are established Anglophone cultures as well as business communities. And in places like India, for example, you will find uh, speakers of English who consider themselves to be native speakers of English. Uh, they are a minority in respect of the entire Indian population, however, if you go to any of the uh, British ex-colonies, you will meet people who consider themselves to be native speakers of English. Um, but there will be a lot of other people who use it quite literally as a second language at various degrees of competency. Um, then, as I said, since 1945, uh, there has been a, an empire, um, a US-led empire, which has been largely based on econ economics or economy, um, culture, and, um, uh, and power, military power in particular. Um, so these three dimensions of the American effect on the world has had a major effect in respect of reinforcing what is all, was already a uh, fairly wide presence of English around the world. But if anything is uh, responsible for ensuring the continuation of that dominance of English in the world, um, it is uh, the United States of America. So what you could say is that um, Britain and uh, the US have been um, English language empires. Different kinds of empires, but they are empires in English. Um, and uh, with the advent of what's known as globalization, uh, popularly called globalization today, interconnectedness, uh, the interconnectedness of the world, um, English is widely um, seen um, or experienced as the first language of globalization. 
Um, if uh, Castellano is the first language um, currently of uh, large parts of South America, well, English is the first language of globalization. Um, according to estimates by the British Council, um, by 2020, there, uh, they say that there will be about uh, 2 billion people learning English in the world globally. So that's a lot of people. Um, now the other thing about the spread of English uh, globally is the connection that is made between, um, uh, between English and economic development, uh, largely as a result of its connection with globalization. And uh, governments around the world, and I've been in many countries uh, for the past few years, and in all of these countries, what you find is that uh, governments, and indeed uh, large parts of the population uh, in these countries, they associate economic development and prosperity, wealth creation, with English and with the learning of English and speaking of English. Um, English is seen as an important, uh, indeed essential requirement uh, for the uh, interconnection of uh, a nation with uh, the global world economy. And um, part of uh, the reason for that is that increasingly around the world uh, today, you find that knowledge is circulated in English. And when I say that, when I say that knowledge is circulated in English, if you look at the leading um, academic research journals in the world today, you will find that the vast majority in whatever field you are looking in are published in English. And so what you have is a colonization of um, knowledge, a colonization of knowledge uh, as represented by research. Uh, globally. And um, related to that is that if you are an academic in a non-English speaking country and you want, or should I say, if you are a researcher, uh, better still, if you're a researcher in a non-English speaking country um, and you want your research to be known internationally, uh, you're going to have to have it published in English. Uh, that may mean translating your research from your own language into English, or, as is increasingly the case, um, many academics around the world, and here is no exception, are writing their academic papers, their research, their books in English. Um, and so, if you're going to... Uh, if you're going to find out, too, what the latest research is in any disciplinary area uh, these days, in order to access that knowledge, you're going to have to be able to use or read at least English. Um, it is, of course, the case that are, there are many journals, academic journals, academic papers and books that are not written in English. But if you want to know why English is so closely associated with globalization processes and, uh, and um, research and uh, knowledge, then that is why. Um, now here in, uh, in Chile, you have the um, Programa Inglés Abre Puertas, which is, uh, which is a very good program, which is um, who the director of that is Isabel Gonzalez, at least she was the last time I was here. I think she still is. Is she not anymore? She still is. Yes. Um, okay, well anyway, even if, she, even if she isn't, it doesn't really matter, but I only include what she said here for interest. Um, I mean, this is very typical of what is said around the world. Um, English is imperative to Chile in terms of business investment. Raising levels of English in schools will ultimately lead to a higher quality workforce, which will in turn attract foreign investment and increase economic development. There you go. That is 
that same kind of discourse is being repeated all over the world uh, by politicians in all the countries of the world. Um, in a Chilean country note at the 12th OECD Japan seminar, which was surprisingly, not surprisingly, in Japan in 2007, um, uh, OECD being uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, um, the Chilean country note said that PIA was a real opportunity for the Chilean population to have real access to globalization. Note the two uses of real, okay? Um, a real opportunity and real access, okay? So, um, as I've said, similar statements are made in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, here in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Jordan, Amman, you name it, you'll find the same sort of thing being said around the world. Um, now, since English has spread around the world, uh, we can conceive of English in a certain kind of way. Uh, we can conceive of English as plural. We can conceive of English as Englishes. And um, you may be familiar with the uh, research and work of um, an applied linguist and academic called Braj Kashru. And Kashru, he, uh, in 1985, developed a little model of English in the world today, which has been very influential. Um, and it's known as Kashru's circles, or concentric circles model of English. And um, it's not meant to be a definitive description of Englishes in the world, but it does help us to understand how English is in the world. And so the, the, um, the circles model, there are three circles involved. The middle circle is called the inner circle. And in the inner circle, you have the native speaker countries. You have Britain, Ireland, uh, USA, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, uh, and so on. Um, and then um, in the outer circle, you have the uh, Englishes of the ex-British colonies. Uh, Singapore, India, Nigeria, Jamaica, and so on. Um, note we're talking about Englishes. And note, too, that even though in the inner circle we have native speaker, native speakers, um, we have different Englishes in the inner circle. I mean, American English is different to British English, uh, which is different to Australian English, which is different to Irish English, uh, and, and so on. So there are different Englishes already in the native speaker um, countries. Um, but we can add to those the Englishes of the uh, outer circle. Uh, so Nigerian English, Jamaican English, um, Singaporean English, Indian English, uh, and so on. Um, and then um, you have the rest, uh, what's called the expanding circle in his model. And in the expanding circle, you have all the remaining countries of the world where English is learnt as a foreign language. Um, there's no colonial uh, history, no colonial um, uh, investment on the part of Britain or the US in these countries. So we're talking about places like France, Germany, Germany Italy, Spain, Chile, China, um, Russia, uh, and so on. And these, um, in these different societies, in these different countries, these different nations, English is being learnt to different levels of competency, clearly. There are those who are complete beginners, and there are those who can speak the uh, language very well. But what's interesting about the Englishes of both the outer and the expanding circles is, well, that they are that we can recognize that they are multiple Englishes, that there's not just one kind of English in the world, there are many kinds of Englishes. Um, 
We can also point to um, the fact that there are more non-native speakers of English than there are native speakers of English in the world. If we count everybody <coughs> that we imagine has a certain competency in English, whether it's intermediate or advanced or, or whatever. Um, another important thing to remember too, or to note, is that there are more non-native teachers of English in the world than there are native teachers of English in the world, and that the majority of teachers of English in the world um, did not learn their English from native speakers. They learned their English from non-native speakers. Um, I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, and the other thing that we might say, uh, although it's very difficult to actually prove this, uh, but we could uh, say that most non-native speakers of English speak English mostly to other non-native speakers. Um, so that you'll have Japanese people talking to Chinese people, talking to German people, talking to Korean people, um, rather than it being, say, Chinese to British or Chinese to American. So there's a lot of communication going on around the world between non-native speakers of English in English. And, um, well, the point is that this leads to many kinds of English. So we can talk about Englishes, plural. Um, and indeed, the um, Braj Kashru's work has contributed very much to the development of a field known as World Englishes. Um, okay, um, so we can talk about the plurality of English, Englishes. Kashu says that English now has multicultural identities. And because English does have multicultural identities, we can also talk about English with local characteristics. English with local characteristics, in which grammatical and rhetorical patterning occurs in the way in which non-native speakers of English use English, which is to say that there's something about their lingua cultural identity which appears through the English that they use. Um, and so what we can then conclude from this is that what we have are do di lots of different kinds of Englishes in circulation in the world that are used for lingua franca purposes. And I refer to this um, as LFEs, lingua franca Englishes. So that when Chinese people and German people and Italian people are together speaking in English, the Chinese speaker is speaking a kind of English with Chinese cadences, Chinese characteristics. Uh, similarly, the, uh, the German speaker is doing the same. Um, the Italian speaker is doing the same. Um, Here's an example from some recent research on, uh, on different kinds of English in the world, and this is, this is an example of Chinese English. Now, as uh, most of you, I think all of you know, not most of you, as all of you know, um, English is considered to be an SVO language. That means subject verb object is the, is the, uh, um, is the principal grammatical paradigm for English. It's not an absolute, we don't say everything, subject, verb, object, you can move it around, but that is the dominant paradigm. Um, Chinese, on the other hand, is not SVO, it's OSV. And so what you find with Chinese speakers of English is that there is a tendency for them to construct sentences in English in which the object is put first and the subject is put second. This doesn't create any problem of comprehension in any sense at all, it doesn't. Uh, and indeed, what is said here could just be as easily said by a native speaker without any real you know, problem with uh, communication. But this particular researcher has collated a very large number of uh, incidences of what he calls Chinese English and the kinds of patternings which appear in Chinese English. Uh, so here we have OSV. Yes, I think many easy words we have forgotten. Uh, there's a Chinese speaker. Now, 
in the dominant uh, native speaker paradigm, you'd probably say, yes, I think we have forgotten many easy words, and put the object at the end. Um, another example here is the inversion of WH clauses, which is something that happens in Chinese. And so uh, here the speaker says, I really don't know what is international English, rather than uh, a native speaker might be more likely to say, I really don't know what international English is. Um, okay, so Zuti Chang is predicting that there is a Chinese English and that it is an evolving variety of English. Um, whether you agree with Zuti Chang is up to you, um, but certainly this kind of research is going around, is being done in a lot of different languages. So here's an example of Chinese English. Um, here's an example of uh, English with Japanese characteristics. Chinese English, incidentally, is sometimes known as Chinglish. Uh, Japanese English is known as Japlish. Greek <coughs> English is known as Greeklish. Portuguese English is known as Portugalish. And Spanish English is known as Spanglish. Um, anyway, here we have an example of English with Japanese characteristics, and one of the one of the features of Japanese is left dislocation. And so when speakers of Japanese uh, speak English, they have a tendency to left dislocate. Um, that car, we've had nothing but trouble with it. Rather than, we've had nothing but trouble with that car. Um, so we have a left dislocation, but native speakers say that as well, but it's very common to find that kind of pattern amongst the English of Japanese speakers. Uh, two people speaking to one another. These are real, by the way. They're not just invented. Um, did you get the bread? Went to the supermarket and bought. Uh, a mission of subject and object uh, in Japanese. English is quite common. Um, I can communicate many people, leaving out prepositions. My purse stolen on bus, leaving out the copula B, or was in this case. Um, there are dogs in yard, a mission of plurals and articles. This came from the research done by a master's student of mine who wrote her dissertation on uh, Japlish, uh, Japanese English. Um, something different uh, is code switching, where people mix their, um, uh, their language in with English. Uh, so here we have an example of Spanish. Uh, this data comes from Florida, I believe. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot attend next week's meeting porque tengo una obligación de negocios en Boston, pero espero que I'll be back for the meeting the week after. Um, te veo ahorita, me voy de shopping para el mar. Um, Dolores dice, need advice, escríbeme. Um, tengo que ir al bus stop para pick up mi hija. <laughs> um, and this was seen an advertising <coughs> sign in Peru. Diaminos para delivery. <laughs> um, I just found these online by typing in Spanglish, so that's what I got. Um, oh, this is sad. Oh, oh, hold on. I think we'll be okay. I think. Uh, F5. Oh. Um, I'm sure this will be all right in a second, but uh, at the moment it's not cooperating. Um, let's just see if I can go down. Right, uh, Spanglish. Um, I'm not sure if somebody could come and just sort of get this up and running again while I carry on talking. But um, if you could get it onto that screen, um, that would be good. Yeah, this one. Um, yeah, you have to scroll down a bit. Okay, that's it. That's good. All right, so I think we're back again. All right, back. Okay. Um, some more Spanglish. 
Uh, again, um, these ones come from, uh, from the US. Um, uh, lonche for al almuerzo, uh, lunch. Cornflake for cornflakes. <laughs> uh, hamburger for hamburger. Uh, hangar to hang out. Um, el parking, which I think is quite common. Rentar, parquear, estás ready. <laughs> Googlear, marqueta, biles, dame el bile. Um, uh, Paré for a fiesta, uh, and so on. So you get this kind of thing as well, uh, which is different, is, I must say, is different to speaking uh, English with Chinese or Japanese characteristics, or indeed with Spanish characteristics. So, but code switching is also a part of, of global English. Now, with so much English, or so many Englishes around, um, and with um, it being the most widely taught language in the world, the um, International Association for Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages came out with this statement a few years ago um, saying that with English being taught globally for very diverse purposes, a singular or monolithic uh, approach to the modeling of English is no longer tenable, is no longer realistic. Um, so a singular or monolithic approach to the modeling of English is no longer tenable, which is to say we need to become conscious that there are diverse Englishes in the world in the teaching of English when we teach it, which is also fair enough to say. We need to be aware of the diversity of Englishes in the world and the way different people are communicating in the world. Um, and so this places a question mark over the place of native speaker models. You know, native speaker models. What is the place of native speaker models in a world of global Englishes, where most of the speakers of English in the world, if you can say that there are more than there are native speakers, are non-native speakers? Um, so this creates interesting questions for us as teachers and pedagogues and, uh, and researchers in language, in English language. So that brings me to ELF. Now a lot of what I've just said is part of the um, argumentation that you find within ELF about the fact that there are far more non-native speakers of English in the world than native speakers. Um, <clears throat> so why are we so fixated about native speaker models? Um, in an ELF perspective, um, non-native Englishes are just seen as different from native speaker Englishes. They are different, not deficient. Okay? They're just different. Um, differences from native varieties are not assumed to be signs of incompetence or error as they are when they are viewed from an EFL perspective. So if you think about EFL, those of us here who've all been EFL teachers, we were all taught to correct our students, you know, correct them. How do you do correction in the classroom? How, what's the best way to correct them? But what are you correcting? You're correcting them to a native speaker standard. That's what we've been trained to do. So rather than treating them as errors, rather than treating non-native speaker English as, as uh, full of errors or displaying error, um, in an ELF perspective, they are explored as emerging or potential features of ELF. Emerging or potential features of ELF. Now what this suggests, or what this appears to imply, is that ELF is an evolving variety of English. Okay. Uh, a kind of native speaker English. Um, I've said that speakers of ELF outnumber those classified as, nat as native speakers considerably. Well, that's what they say, but uh, that's what they say. Um, so, to repeat, why should, na not, why should native speakers be the model for English taught around the world? That is the question that is put 
by elf researchers. Okay? Why should native speakers be the model for English taught around the world? It's a fair question. Okay, what is ELF? What is it? Uh, now, Barbara Seidelhofer, in a seminal paper in 2004, she um, collated some typical, what she saw as typical features of ELF. Um, they include non-use of the third person present tense. So, for example, um, she look very sad instead of she looks very sad. Um, interchangeable use of the relative pronouns who and which. A book who, a person which. Um, omission of definite and indefinite articles where they are obligatory or compulsory in native speaker English and insertion where they do not occur in native speaker English. Use of all-purpose question tags, such as isn't it or no. They should arrive soon, no? They should arrive soon, isn't it? Um, this is very typical, isn't it? It's very typical in Indian English. Um, and then one that you may well be very familiar with here, pluralization of nouns which are considered uncountable in native speaker English. Informations, staffs, advices. Uh, thank you for all your advices. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of staffs working here. Um, now, the discussions around ELF and world Englishes um, have uh, sparked interest in the pedagogic implications. Um, and this has led to a discussion of the likely impact on the language syllabus, teaching materials and methods, language assessment, uh, and language teacher education. Um, so what would have to change is the question. What would have to change if we were to um, move uh, away from using uh, native speakers or native speakers as models in the classroom? What would be the effect on these things here? Um, I've already said this actually, so I'm not going to repeat it, but, but basically um, uh, in, a, in a sentence um, why should we uh, why should we be using native speakers as our model is the argument um, Martin Dewey has argued that elf is seen as fluid flexible contingent hybrid and deeply intercultural it's seen as innovative original flexible uh, malleable people uh, accommodating and and evolving original ways of communicating with one another in English as non-native speakers. Um, now, I don't have time to tell you everything that I find problematic about the ELF perspective, but my paper was a theoretical one. Um, one of the first things I wanted to point out is that ELF is not a language. Um, but researchers who write about ELF write as if it were a language, which I find somewhat contradictory. Um, so they will write about elf settings, written elf, spoken elf, elf speakers, elf interactions. It is the skill of converging appropriately that constitutes correctness in elf. Um, <coughs> the other thing that I found uh, problematic is that most of the research on intercultural encounters has been in relation to what I would consider to be elite speakers or elite users of English globally. Uh, these include business people, <coughs> diplomats, and international students. Um, there's also a general lack of recognition of structural inequality uh, in language learning uh, in writings about ELF. The assumption is that everybody has access to, equal access to English. Or there is a, seems to be an unspoken assumption that everybody has equal access to English. But you only have to look at the CIMSE results in Chile for the past um, two uh, sessions, the 2010 and the 2012 results, and you will see that, that, that um, the results are uh, in part to be explained because of the unequal access 
to English and the structural inequalities which exist with regard to access to English, not just in Chile, but around the world globally. And this is not really discussed in health research. Um, uh, and so, for myself, I don't see a lot of relevance of ELF for national education policies in different countries around the world. Um, I've mentioned uh, what I've called LFEs, lingua franca Englishes. I see them as plurilingual. I see uh, communication between non-native speakers as a plurilingual event in which different kinds of English are being spoken at the same time, rather than elf. Do you see what I mean? I'm, I'm saying the, the Chinese speaker is speaking English with Chinese characteristics, the Japanese speaker is speaking English with Japanese characteristics, the Spanish speaker is speaking English with Spanish characteristics. You can call it elf if you want to, but I don't. I call it LFEs, lingua franca Englishes. Um, I've talked about um, structural inequality, um, uh, the Englishes are differentiated in terms of class, race, gender, economy, and religion, amongst other things. Um, and the other thing that we should remember is that when people, when non-native speakers are speaking to one another in English, um, it's not only uh, globalized and largely white elites in international business diplomacy and research contexts who are doing so. There are a lot of other people who are speaking English as well who don't come from such elite groups. Right, so that brings me to imminent critique. Um, now, I've already told you what it is. Um, this is a more technical definition of imminent critique. But basically what it's saying is that you go inside the argument and you use the arguments that are made within that position and you use them against the position. That is what's called an imminent critique. You critique your object um, uh, on its own terms. You use its own arguments against it. Um, now, a key term in my paper is what is a rather theoretical term called hypostatization. Now, all hypostatization means, and there are a lot of native speakers of English who don't know what hypostatization is, uh, and I dare say that the, the elf people who read my paper, they probably had to go and look it up as well. Um, but hypostatization is a theoretical concept which refers to how abstract ideas or abstract concepts are treated as if they are real. Okay, as if they are real. Um, they're artificially concretized and made real. So for example, here we have Moranen and Metzakatella. <coughs> they write, this special issue is written in Elf. Elf is an apostatization because here we have elf presented as if it were a language, okay? Whereas my argument is that elf isn't a language. So, but here it's presented as if it were a language. Like, this special issue is written in Italian. This special issue is written in German. This special issue is written in um, Spanish. This special issue, however, is written in elf. Um, the fact that interactions examined in this article took place in ELF warrants a comment uh, made by House in 2012. She's another uh, ELF researcher. Um, Seidelhofer, in the early 21st century, it seems clear that there are English using local, regional, and global communities of practices, practice communicating via ELF. Um, there are very, very many of these kinds of examples where ELF is presented as if it were a variety. Now, if it's a variety, that means or would imply that it is institutionalized in some way, that it is codified in some way, that there are dictionaries, that are, there are grammars, and so on. But there aren't. They don't exist. Um, but they nevertheless continue to talk about it as if it were a language. Um, now, this is where it gets a little bit theoretical. I'm not going to spend too much time hurting you with this, okay, beating you with this, but um, 
I've, over the past few years, I've been reading my way through Karl Marx. Particularly since the 2008 financial crisis, I thought a lot of the ideas that Marx has uh, in terms of his critique of capitalism seem very relevant to the travails or the global travails of our times. And so I've been reading Marx um, with some colleagues at, uh, at the IOE. And having read Marx, uh, or Das Kapital, um, volume one to be precise, while reading it, I had some ideas about um, uh, how you could use Marxist uh, concepts in, in uh, discussing things like English and Lingua Franca. Um, now, Marx talks about the commodity. Uh, Capital Volume 1 is all about the commodity. He starts off by saying uh, <coughs> the marketplace is full of commodities. So, um, what, uh, what does he say about the commodity? Um, well, he says, the wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails or exists appears as an immense collection of commodities. The individual commodity appears as its elementary form. Our investigation therefore begins with analysis of the commodity. Um, now, the commodity, this is the key bit, and he calls this commodity fetishism. The commodity is simply the form of appearance of a content that is distinguishable from it. What does that mean? What it means is that um, when you go into a supermarket and buy something off the shelf, a tin of beans or a cabbage or a uh, packet of lettuce or something, you are buying a commodity. But what you don't see is the social investment in the production of that commodity. You do not see the social relations which were uh, applied in producing the thing that you buy. You just see the commodity. You don't see the workers. You don't see the conditions they work in. You don't know what the conditions were. You don't know what the relationship between the workers were, was in the production of the commodity. You don't know what kind of production system they were operating within. All you really see is the commodity. So the commodity is simply the form of, of appearance of a content that is distinguishable from it. And the content that is distinguishable are the, is the social relations that exist in order to produce that commodity, which are actually in the commodity, but you don't see it. All right, so you're with me with that, okay? So you see the cabbage, you see the tin of beans, uh, you see whatever it is, your bag of lettuce, but you don't see the, the social relations. That's what the point, that's the point that Marx was making. Now I use this as a metaphor for describing elf. Um, Marx talks about commodity fetishism. He says this mystification, this obscuring of social relations is, in his words, a form of fetishism. Um, so, I used his notion of commodity fetishism and I applied it to Elf and called it lingua franca fetishism. Now remember, what happens when uh, writers or researchers, Elf researchers, when they research and write about Elf, they write about it as if it were a variety, as if it were a thing, like a commodity. Um, that you can see and hold and pick up. Um, and in the hands of elf researchers, um, the linguistic pragmatic interactions of speakers of different first languages assume the nature of a fantastic relation between speakers of an apostatized universal code. Right complicated way to say something, but what it means is that um, in elf research, elf is presented as if it were a universal code, as if it were already codified, as if it were already institutionalized. Um, and this, I'm saying, is a myth is a myth. It's not a variety. 
It's, there's no codification. It's a myth that's at the heart of the discourse of Elf. Um, now, this little theoretical formula of mine is how Elf becomes constructed as a thing in itself. First of all, you have a settling or freezing uh, or solidification of the concept of English as a lingua franca. This is what's known as reification, where something is made more concrete, made more solid. The process of making things solid is called reification. The result is hypostatization, whereby the thing becomes a thing. This leads to fetishism, or an obsessive preoccupation with the thing. The thing, in this case, is elf. Um, elf itself becomes an ideology. It becomes an ideology which legitimizes the research. It becomes the reference to which we all point in terms of legitimizing what we do. Um, I've spelt consciousness wrongly there, but never mind. Um, ideology is a false consciousness. Um, I mean, in Marxism, uh, uh, Marx, well, Marx doesn't actually talk, strictly speaking, about false consciousness, but in a classical Marxist perspective, ideology is what prevents us from seeing our true interests. Okay? And so for Marx, uh, or for classical Marxism, we labor under a, under a false set of perceptions. And if we could see, if we could only see our material existence, the reality of it, we would change. Now, that might be very idealistic, but that's, in a nutshell, what he was trying to get at. Um, and I see something similar going on with the construction of English as a lingua franca. Um, so, to summarize then, elf as an apostatized form, elf, a thing. Um, the other thing that I haven't talked about is that within the discourse of elf research, there is a premium placed upon empirical research, because empirical research, as you well know, is related with true knowledge, truth, empirical research. But at the same time, within the uh, intellectual field of English lingua franca, um, there is a great deal of emphasis placed upon uh, flexibility, transferability, um, hybridity, um, and these are all constructs which are taken from post-structuralist conceptions of knowledge and understanding and belief. And what I say in my paper is that if you're going to combine post-structuralist perceptions of knowledge with empirical perceptions of truth, you are actually operating in a theoretical contradiction with yourself because post-structuralism rejects the concept of truth. Um, so there is a theoretical imbalance, uh, perturbance, within the theoretical construction of English as a lingua franca because they combine empirical perceptions of truth with post-structuralist perceptions of knowledge. And that's a contradiction in terms. Now, it's OK to do that if you know that you are, are there is a contradiction that is possible there. But you need to be aware of the contradiction if you're going to use the two. The problem with ELF is they're not aware of the contradiction. And that's part of my imminent critique. They use post-structuralism, they use positivist empiricism, but they're not aware of the contradiction between the two. Um, I've already mentioned the focus on elite groups of users in the research. Um, and the other thing that I want to say is that um, a lot of the research writes as if ELF is something that is very recent. Um, as though it hasn't been something that has been around for centuries. Um, 
Okay, I wasn't expecting that slide to appear, but <laughs> it doesn't matter that it did appear, um, because I'm aware that I am running out of time, and I do want to stop fairly soon. Um, this particular uh, slide is uh, in reference to the fact that, well, is, is moving us towards um, what do we do about native speaker English? What do we do about it? Do we still use it as a model? Why should we use it as a model? Um, now, I've talked about structural inequality in the world. We all recognize that the world is structurally unequal. Now, I don't pretend that we're going to change that tomorrow. We're not. Um, but the point is, it is structurally unequal. And we are working within systems over which we do not have a lot of control. Um, and when you look at uh, systems with regard to English language globally, you will find that the most socially valued forms of English in the world today are, surprise, surprise, native speaker forms, standardized models. They are the most highly valued. If any of you are familiar with the work of Paul B, um, how do you say it? Pierre Bourdieu, he talks about symbolic capital. He talks about linguistic capital, cultural capital, social capital. Um, well, English is right up there uh, with ha having the highest quotient of symbolic capital in the world today. And I don't need to go into detail, you know it. We see it around us all the time. Um, Christine Lagarde is the uh, president, current president of the International Monetary Fund. I was reading the Financial Times, uh, not that I do it all the time, but it's nice to say to impress people. I was reading the uh, Financial Times, and um, this uh, was written by a Financial Times journalist about Christine Lagarde, uh, the leader of the International Monetary Fund. And uh, Christine Lagarde, as you may well know, is French. Um, and she speaks English with a French accent. Um, but the salient fact about her is her English. Absorbed over 25 years in the US, her English is key to why everyone almost instinctively turned to her to replace Dominique Strauss-Kahn at the IMF. The Economist called her a superb communicator, a good negotiator, and an excellent manager. Lagarde is a woman of 4 R times. To make it very big nowadays, this is the key bit, to make it very big nowadays, speaking English usually isn't enough. You need perfect English. Um, something in the way she speaks, the Financial Times. That's what uh, Cooper said. Now, I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm just saying this is a material reality which we have to deal with as teachers. Um, this was the slide I was expecting to appear, which was about the ahistoricity of ELF, which is that it assumes that, that people have not been used, not been, or appears to assume, or it appears to apply, that people have not been using English as a lingua franca for very long, or that it's only been around since the advent of globalization. My argument is that it's been around for centuries. And a more diachronic pers historical perspective, one that took the long view, would see that English has been around for a long time. Um, I have a set of books by um, an Englishman called Richard Hapiot, um, who wrote uh, a 10 volume um, history of the principal navigations, voyages, traffics, and discoveries of the English nation. Um, he published it in 1589. Now, the English is a bit ancient, but um, he's talking about markets which, uh, which different people go to, different countries, nations, traders go to, uh, to which marts that Englishmen call fairs. Each nation oft maketh her repairs, so they go. English and French, Lombards, uh, Genoese, Catalones, there they take her ways. Scots, Spaniards, Irishmen, there abides, and so on. Now the point I'm saying is that there must have been people using English as a lingua franca then. It's not a new thing. 
Similarly, when I was reading about um, the history of piracy in the Caribbean, a lot of the pirate ships in the Caribbean um, were multinational. They had multinational crews. And amongst the pirate ships, there were English captains. They were English ships. And so the language of the ship would have been English, but they were multinational crews. And this is, uh, the, this is in the 1730s. So what I'm trying to say is that lingua franca, English, is not a new thing. Um, the other key argument which is made by, uh, in ELF research is that non-native speakers are accommodating to one another in special and original ways that they are able to communicate um, in a way which native speakers are not capable of, that they are evolving original ways of communicating with one another. Now, okay, okay, but I want to say that accommodation is not new to communication. If you are, um, sorry, if you are familiar with the hermeneutic and analytical traditions in philosophy and linguistics, for example, through the work of Jürgen Habermas, um, George Gadamer, or uh, Henry Paul Grice, um, they have shown how accommodation and cooperation are basic to all, all human communication and action. That, in fact, human communication is based upon accommodation. We can't communicate with one another without it. Um, so accommodation is not something that is unique to elf encounters, uh, is my point. Um, so my conclusions are, um, well, Britain and the US, uh, as empires in English, are responsible for making English the first language of globalization. Um, the pressures of economic development globally emphasize English as a necessary skill in the global, global marketplace, as well as for personal social mobility and advancement. And this is a material reality, whether I agree with it or not. It is a material reality. Um, globalization of English has led to a world of Englishes. This has long-term implications for the kinds of English to be taught. Certainly it does and what the principal model should be. But, as yet, the desirability of teaching alternatives to standard native speaker models has not, in my view, been convincingly established by ELF research. Um, and that, in my view, ELF is theoretically inadequate as a basis for such a revision. And that is, in a nutshell, my argument. And these are the two papers that I wrote recently on this. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you like, really, or to explain anything you weren't, you know, you weren't clear about. Um, um, as I said, it is a theoretical paper, so it's not really that easy to, to, uh, to follow, necessarily. But um, it's available online, the first one, the one that I've tried to talk to today. Uh, you'll find it goes into much more detail than I've been able to today, um, but you, you will find it there. Is it possible to get this uh, video or uh, conference? I Perhaps? don't... I, is it possible to get the video conference? Uh, I'll find out. I mean, we could certainly share the, the, the PowerPoint presentation with you. Um, I'll find out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question and I yeah. also have a comment. Yeah. The first question is, um, um, uh, at the beginning of your presentation, you argued that um, e um, ELF is not a language. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear a little bit about your reasons to um, not defining it as a, as a language. Okay, okay. Um, secondly, um, yeah, you propose um, as, a, as an alternative to your uh, critique to this uh, notion of, of, of ELF that um, um, 
one way or another, we as language teachers should also, we, we, con we should continue to focus on uh, the patterns and the structure of native English as, mm -hmm. as, as, um, as it's spoken in um, uh, the inner circle communities. Um, I, may, I may say that I may sort of disagree there from, um, um, from um, English as a foreign language speaker perspective. Um, when I when I think about my own experience and the experience of you know my students, uh, where we rather than focusing and targeting a native-like kind of English, what we really try to do is we're trying to help them develop their language competence, um, uh, and that basically means helping them um, developing the communication tools. Um, so that they are able to express themselves in English um, but, and, and also understand English from native speakers as well as from non-native speakers, uh, but also keeping in mind that we are speaking English from a cultural perspective that is different, definitely different from the cultural perspective of a native speaker, which we shouldn't sort of aiming at because we are different English speakers. So that, that would be my, my comment and see what you're... I'm to. so glad you said that. I agree with every word you've just said. Why? Because what I didn't have time to say is that... Um, I'll take the second one first and I'll go back to the first one. Um, but what I, I didn't really have time to say uh, is that I don't think you should uh, be teaching native speaker, native speaker English. I don't think you should be teaching that. But what I do think is that in terms of the linguistic gatekeepers which exist out there, part of the uh, repertoire that you need to be able to offer your learners is that they are able to negotiate the linguistic gatekeepers who put such a huge emphasis on the symbolic uh, capital, which is, and I emphasize, formal, standard, native, nativized English. Not colloquial English, not speaking English with an American accent, not, not teaching them US culture or British culture or how to be American or how to be British, not indeed uh, making the mistake that was made this since 2010 and testing the young people with cultural forms of English that were completely alien to them uh, in the test. Um, I actually said this when I came three years ago. One of my arguments was that you should dump TOEIC, get rid of TOEIC and create Chilean tests for Chilean people. Um, so I, I do agree with all of that. I, I really want to emphasize, so I'm glad you said that, because I agree with you. But nevertheless, the symbolic capital thing has to be dealt with. And what you find globally is that those who are in the most the, the elite positions, those who have access to global power, as it were, they are operating with formal, stand, nativized, standard models of English. If we want our learners to be able to compete with those kinds of people, we need, they need to be able to have the possibility within their repertoire to use and to compete on the same level with these people. And that's why I feel that the native speaker model, as I've just defined it, is still a very important one for the classroom. But with all the caveats which you mentioned and said much more articulately than, than I did, I agree with you. Uh, so that's my position on that one. Mm -hmm. On the question of um, elf as a variety or a language, I don't see it as a language, uh, partly um, because um, it is deeply hybrid. And its hybridity is what makes it not institutionalized as a standard form. Uh, for it to be institutionalized, it would have to have a certain regularity, which it doesn't have. 
uh, as I tried to sort of suggest in my talk, when different native speakers of English, non-native speakers of English, are speaking to one another, they are using different cadences, they're using different characteristics in their English language production, which are products of their lingua cultural background, their, their L1. Now, I'm not saying, I don't know well, I wouldn't be able to say, oh, maybe in 300 years' time there will be something called ELF. But if there is, or if there were, 300 years from now, something that was international English, well, then that would be the new standard. And there would be lots of non-standard versions. You'd just end up back exactly where we are now. And that, unless we are going to change the global structures of our world, that will still be used as a form of symbolic capital then. So nothing would have really changed. And the structural inequalities will still be there. And then you'll have to be teaching your learners the international standard, which everybody's, you know, those who are global elites are speaking. So I don't see how ELF gets us out of that. But from the linguistic perspective, it's certainly not codified. And to be codified, it would need to have uh, grammars, it would need to have dictionaries, uh, it would need to have the whole uh, whole bundle that goes with teaching, for example, English or Italian or French or German or Spanish or Portuguese. So that's why I'm saying it's not a language in that sense. Yeah? Um, perhaps just thinking on the, in, in my own experience, I have uh, seen an example of that mm. when I had a student who was a lawyer uh, here in a classroom uh, in Chile, who arrived late to the class, apologized for being late, sat down and said, I've just had the most difficult day trying to communicate with a group of Chinese businessmen in English. He was coming with his Chilean, uh, Chileanized, version of English, they were coming with their Chinglish, as we want to, to call it, and they, they were finding it very, very difficult to communicate. And that was in a, in a business situation. Um, and he said at one point, he, you know, he, he just said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I don't know what you want the, the document to say. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a big problem. And mm -hmm. so this idea that somehow it's one language it, it can't. It, it's not. It's not going to be that, and and so you say until it's standardised. Yes. In which case, it's the same as. Mm. as the other. Yes. Yes. Can I add something? Yes. Can you that? Well, I, I have the same question. That's why I want to get into it, because when Luther uh, said that the church wasn't the, the like, totalitarian. Uh, the church lost power and they created many different churches Lutheranian, Protestant, different churches what happens if we say that uh, the English is not well, there's no help uh, English as a lingua franca uh, well, all the people will teach their own way of, of picking it, of producing it and how do we control that? So we want, so we don't uh, get that too wide. Um, yeah, I, I, you, you're you're talking about the mutual unintelligibility argument that that, that we carry on this way. Everybody speaking English with their own characteristics, we will be become mutually unintelligible uh, to one another. Um, I, I, I see the point. Uh, I don't think, however, that we are actually teaching different Englishes to... I don't think we are teaching because we're still using the grammars and vocabularies and dictionaries that are based on uh, the standardized models which we are taking into our classrooms. The departure from the standard form in the production happens anyway. It's, it, it happens anyway. People 
don't come, well, very few walk into the classroom and then walk out speaking standard English. They usually come into the classroom, they learn a lot of English, then they walk out and they speak it in their own way. Uh, they speak it in their own way, and they may well speak it if, they're, if, if their lingual cultural background is Chilean and Spanish, then that's the way they probably will produce it. Um, uh, certainly in the intermediate, upper intermediate stages of their linguistic production, they will certainly do that. Um, it will depend how far they go along that, um, that pathway to uh, really becoming a, a highly standardized speaker of, of English. Um, it's actually a very small minority that ever arrive at that in spoken production. And that's a key difference as well. How you speak, fine, you know. Um, but when you look at what's written, if you look at the documentation produced by the World Bank in English, or the International Monetary Fund, or the European Commission, or any of these elite global institutions, you will find that it is native, nativized standard English that is being put on the page, even as it was written by multilingual teams. Now, uh, so I'm not sure that I would say that there is a kind of inevitable mutual unintelligibility. However, I do believe that we should respect local cultures and local practices and local ways of doing things. And uh, I, have, um, I have a lot of time for research by people like Alistair Pennycook who talk about using English as a local practice. I have a lot of uh, time for the post-colonial writers like Humura Vardavelu and Kanagaraja, amongst others, who talk about respecting local academic cultures in, in teaching, uh, particularly in, in methodology. Um, so I'm, I'm okay with all of that. And indeed, I'll go further and say that amongst the very good work that is being done in the ELF research, is work on what they call a lingua franca core, which is to do with the um, mutual intelligibility end of things and based on the teaching of pronunciation and what are core kind of core pronunciation patterns which are shared across many languages. And that's where a lot of very interesting work is being done. My critique is very focused very much on the theoretical conception, how it's been produced. So I don't think we're necessarily moving towards you know, mutual unintelligibility. And I also think, as your very good example uh, showed, that, that successful communication is a negotiation. And that there has to be a will. There has to be a will to want to communicate, to try to understand. Maybe you won't always understand, but the will has to be there. And as long as the will is there, then there is a way. When there's a will, there's a way. But there will be times when communication breaks down. I mean, that's just inevitable. That's, that's life. That's how, that's how we are. So we have to deal with that. Um, but I think, it is, I, I think communication is negotiation. It always is. Um, yeah, so thanks for those comments. Yeah. I don't know if you have an answer for this. How have textbook writers, publishers, and institutions involved in English language assessment uh, reacted to the, the concept of ELF? Um, well, it's mixed, really. It's mixed. Um, I don't really know in detail the answer to your, your question. But, but what, what I can say is that there is a greater consciousness amongst textbook writers these days of Englishes, yeah? Of Englishes, of English as a global language, and how there are different Englishes being spoken. And again, I will compliment the elf researchers. They part of their argument is we should make our learners aware of those different Englishes out there, and not just teach them one kind, like um, um, you know, just when you do listenings, it's all American English or it's all British English. Don't do that. L give them other Englishes to listen. Give them Chinese English to, to listen to. You know, just to sort of experience that there are other Englishes out there. There is a greater consciousness. However, while there's a greater consciousness, there's also a massive 
multi-million, billion dollar industry in textbook writing. And they're very difficult to change. You know, a leopard doesn't change its spots very easily. And um, there's also huge um, pressure from the inner circle countries who want to, well, you, you, it's obvious really, they want to sell you their English. And so you find that assessment is dominated by TOEIC or American and British um, testing systems, IELTS, TOEFL, uh, all of these uh, different uh, operations. So a lot of the industry itself gets in the way of, of changing or creating a more diverse, um, what my colleague John Gray would call a, um, a global textbook. Uh, one that is more, uh, more uh, culturally diverse, culturally aware, glo global culturally aware. Um, and as regards um, assessment, again, that's very slow moving. Because when I look at um, different, uh, when I look at different countries around the world, um, there isn't, there's hardly any country in the world that that isn't using um, uh, some kind of assessment for university entrance, for example, which involves an English test. And those English tests, invariably around the world, are based on either American or British uh, models. Um, um, but certainly, those who do assess are, co are becoming increasingly conscious of the diversity of English. However, being conscious of that as academics, um, being conscious of that intellectually in our, in our field, is not the same as popular understandings of what is English, uh, what English is, and certainly governments are amongst the most ignorant when it comes to what, what we are trying to do. And so they will always go for what they think is the most symbolically appropriate. And that tends to be a native speaker model. Um, so it's mixed, really. You know, we're caught in that system here again. Um, um, but there is, a, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of awareness, but I don't know that so much is getting into practice. Mind you, in Hong Kong, I do know that they have instituted, they used to test people according to native, the, 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 the barometer was native speaker competence, but now they're using a local, local, um, uh, a local standard, as it were. The, the, the speakers that they are aspiring to are people, you may, may have never heard of her, somebody called Anson Chan. And Anson Chan used to be a very senior member of the executive council, sort of second only to the um, chief executive. Um, and her English is her English is excellent, uh, but she speaks it with a Chinese accent. She doesn't speak it with a British accent. She speaks with a Chinese accent. She's quite clearly Chinese. She's very Chinese in the way she speaks English. So that's now the kind of spoken standard that is top score in the assess speaking assessment in Hong Kong. Um, but I don't know that that's replicated. In many countries, they don't even have a speaking test for entering university. Yeah. yeah uh, as English is being spoken in diverse social cultural context, uh, what do you think is the role of identity, uh, of the speaker's identity, uh, or issues about identity uh, in, this, um, in the teaching of English as as a global language? Well, I think that, um, I think I, our identities, our identities um, are not essential things. We construct identities in different social spaces that we find ourselves in. I certainly, I mean, I speak a bit of Spanish. I'm not brilliant, but I, I speak some Spanish. I do feel like I'm a slightly different person when I speak Spanish, in the way in which I go about communicating with people. I think I am a bit more direct in Spanish than I am in, in English. I think I just go 
you know, straight to it a bit more. I feel a bit more assertive in Spanish. Don't know why, but uh, but I do, and uh, le less sort of uh, you know less British, if you like. Um, but um, I think we have uh, we have we have identities, but they're not fixed. I, I'm, I'm not a believer in fixed identities. Uh, I believe we kind of move and 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 we we uh, shift as we enter into different kinds of social contexts. I think that identity is is a crucial part of who we are as human beings and as, as speakers of different languages. Um, and I don't think that. Um, we have to lose our identities uh, in learning English for global purposes. Um, I think we can still be Latinos or you know Chinese or Indian or, or, or whatever. And I do feel that accommodation is part of the human condition. So we, we accommodate even when we're arguing with one another, we're trying to accommodate. Um, there is a lot of research being done on our language and identity. Um, and one of the big, uh, well, one of the, the, the big areas of, of research at the moment in, in relation to language and identity is to do with um, uh, lesbian, gay, uh, transgender identities in, 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 in language learning and how we kind of recognize these kinds of identities. Um, and that's a new area that's kind of opening up now um, because, you know, a lot of the textbooks, for example, deal with very much heterosexual kind of identities. But we're all kinds of identities. We're not just heterosexual identities. Uh, and that's something that is uh, being discussed a lot. Um, as I said a few moments ago, I, I, I do, I have, I have a lot of sympathy with post-colonial thinking on identity and, and respecting local cultures and local ways of doing things. Um, but uh, I say all of that with the caveat of have, still having to deal with the linguistic gatekeepers and uh, negotiating the linguistic gatekeepers. So you still need to have that sort of uh, symbolic repertoire, the standard model. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question very well, but that's the kind of best yeah, I can do at the yeah, moment. Yeah, in a kind, well, I have the feeling, I'm a teacher of English here in Chile. I've been teaching English for about 20 years. And in high schools, and I have the feeling uh, <coughs> that we are still teachers of English. It's my opinion that we are too uh, very stuck to the native model. So uh, I think that it's important to start incorporating in our teaching identity of our students, because uh, if we don't, uh, we we can have the the students um, like in a way to say freedom to speak the English as their, as, uh, on their own right. Because uh, we need to speak English, uh, we are Chileans, and we have our own accent. Mm. So we don't need to imitate an American or a Canadian. Uh, that's what I'm saying to my students. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah that's, and, that's uh, what I think. Yeah, mm. I, I did a research on this, that's mm. what I'm asking you. And yeah. And in the research implication, I interviewed some teachers from Chile, and mm. they are still too stuck to the native model. Yeah. I think in spoken English, I, I couldn't agree with you more, that you should retain uh, your own spoken identity as, as Chil you know, the Chileno um, in English. Um, you don't need to, to speak like an American. You don't need to speak like a British person. You just need to be comprehensible, you know, and and have the will to communicate, even when sometimes comprehension breaks down. You know, it's just having the will. Uh, but but I think it's very important that you you, you do what you have said, and uh, I agree with you.